I was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey, October the 15th, 1941, uh, six weeks before Pearl Harbor. Uh, my father is not a veteran. He was a welder at the Brooklyn Navy Yard during World War II. Um, unfortunately, on August the 18th, 1948, my mother, uh, Irene Herring, passed away from appendicitis. And myself and my younger sister and brother, who were twins, we ended up in the orphanage in, um, in the Bronx in New York. Um, it was called the Woody Crest Home for the Friendless, and it was a, uh, a Protestant orphanage, and we had uh, Puerto Rican children there, we had African American children there, and we had uh, white children there, and they were very, very good. Uh, the horror stories you hear about the orphanage were not, were not so in this orphanage. It was uh, very well run and uh, you had different age groups but the best part about it was that in the summer we didn't stay in the Bronx we went to a camp in Bear Mountain New York Camp Woodycrest and we were there every summer and then uh, when we finished the camp we went back to uh, the Bronx and we started school I started out at the uh, PS 73 in the Bronx and then I graduated from there in the eighth grade and I started my freshman year in uh, 1956 uh, 1955 actually 1955 in the fall I started William Howard Taft High School in the Bronx but um, the Lord intervened and uh, someone that was a friend of the family, uh, took my sister and brother and myself out of the orphanage. And she said the Lord told her to do this. And she took us to Trenton, New Jersey, where uh, she and my father raised us. And she said the Lord told her to do this until we graduated high school. Well, I graduated high school in Trenton, New Jersey in June of 1959. And I went to work in the, uh, in the jewelry business. I started out as a watch repairman doing jewelry and watch repair. And I did that until 1962 when Vietnam was heating up and all my buddies were getting drafted. And luckily my cousin Gerald, Gerald Herring, he was on the USS Hardhead, SS-365, and he came his, his submarine was at the Philadelphia Naval Yards, which is about 30 miles south of Trenton, New Jersey. And he came to visit me and he said, Albert, do not wait to get drafted. Go down tomorrow, join the Navy and volunteer for submarines. You won't regret it. And I thank him to this day because that's exactly what I did. I went down the next day, joined the U.S. Navy, volunteered for submarines. And uh, I... I I, I got to choose my uh, uh, duty station for my basic training or boot camp, and that was San Diego. And uh, got to fly on a jet plane for the first time out of Philadelphia and ended up in San Diego. And I graduated from uh, boot camp um, in June of 1962. And prior to that, I was... Uh, interviewed for the Naval Academy and they they said um, enlisted men from the fleet to the Naval Academy but unfortunately I was uh, six months too old to uh, go to the Naval Academy so who knows what would have happened with my life if I'd have done that but then I graduated in uh, in June of 62 and my orders then were to go to electronics technician school Great Lakes Naval Training Center in uh, North Chicago, Illinois. So I went from there to the Great Lakes and uh, they, they taught me different radar systems, specifically the SPS-10 radar, which is a, a surface search radar. And I uh, graduated from there in October of 1963. 
at which time I got orders to go to submarine school in Groton, Connecticut in October 1963. Prior to that, um, we had an experience that unfortunately we lost one of our submarines, the USS Thresher, was doing uh, test dives after uh, an overhaul and uh, the Thresher sunk April the 10th, 1963. A lot of the um, seamen that were in the uh, sub-school, they non-volunteered to uh, uh, other, uh, to the surface Navy. But uh, I was determined to be a submarine sailor. And then I graduated um, December the 18th, 1963. I graduated from sub-school and on uh, December the 19th, I reported on board the USS Grouper, SS-214, which was a World War II diesel submarine that had done 12 war patrols in World War II and was my, my next duty station. So I was on board there until um, we, set, we set out of Groton, Connecticut in January 1963, 64, January 64, we, we left uh, Grot, Connecticut, heading for San Juan, Puerto Rico, with a stop in um, Bermuda. We had a uh, naval base that we were leasing from the uh, British government, and we, we pulled in there um, to get our mail and to refuel and stuff. But after we had left uh, uh, Groton on the second day, I uh, was on the helm in the conning tower and uh, we had a storm off of Cape Hatteras, which was nothing like I'd seen before. Now this is my first time at sea and uh, it was just unreal as the expression goes. And what happened I'm in the conning tower on the helm, and we had two look two lookouts up above uh, in the sail. We called it the sail, which is the top part of the submarine, and that's where the officer of the deck is on the bridge. And it was so rough, and the waves were so bad, the captain secured the bridge. Watch, and the lookouts and the officer of the deck came down, and in coming down, we. Uh, we got this wave that came over the submarine like nothing you ever saw. And it was just a solid, solid wall of water. And I left the helm and I turned around and went to the ladder going to the bridge and pulled the lanyard with all my strength. And I got the hatch to close and I dogged it down. And when I dropped down into the conning tower, the water was over my knees and we didn't know what it was with the west of the submarine, but uh, we, we finally got communication with the control room down below and we pumped the water out. And then after the fact, I found out that my shipmate, Dave Overholt, was down in the uh, engine room and he had the foresight to close the main induction valve, which really saved the submarine. Otherwise, we'd have, we'd have sunk right there in the Atlantic. So we get to Bermuda and uh, we, uh, we got our mail and everything and just a beautiful island. And then uh, we left there when we went to Puerto Rico. And people don't know this, but we had a submarine base in St. Thomas, right out by the airport. And uh, while, while in uh, while in Puerto Rico, we had an ex ex I had an experience that I wanted to go to see the rainforest. Uh, it was called El Yonque, and it's a, a national park in, in Puerto Rico. And uh, my my friend Bud and I, we were we were going to go out there, and uh, we were going to rent a car. So we go to the rental car place, and they said, "Oh, we can't rent to enlisted men." So. My, my buddy says, well, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to hitchhike out there. So we, we hitchhike, and uh, this uh, Puerto Rican who spoke no English uh, picks us up, 
and we told them El Yonke, El Yonke. And he said, see, sí, see. Sí. So I knew we were going out there. And then I see a sign on the side of the road and it said, El Yonke, right turn. And I, I knew a little Spanish because I had Spanish in high school. And I said, aquí, aquí. So finally he stopped and we got out and we, uh, we got a ride up to, uh, up to El Yonke. And we were just walking around and it's a rainforest. So we've been walking around for 30 to 45 minutes and it started to rain. So we got into the, um, the local bar there and we were uh, having a beer and reminiscing about our ride in the pickup truck coming out. It was funny because we were laughing and then uh, I, heard a, I heard a voice from my right and it was a, a female voice and she said, are you laughing at us? And I picked up my drink and I walked over to where she was sitting and she was there with another woman. And I said, why would we laugh at two beautiful women? You know, there's no way. She said, oh, we had such a time. She said, we, we rented a car in San Juan and all they had was a standard shift. And we don't know how to drive a standard shift, neither one of us. And we must have stalled out 20 times coming up here to El Yonke. Do you know how to drive a stick shift? And I said, yes, I do. She said, oh, would you please drive us back to San Juan? And it's funny because previously, my friend Bud said to me, Al, if we hitchhike out, how are we gonna get back? I said, we're gonna meet two girls and they're gonna they're bring us back to San Juan. Just BS, but, uh, but that's what happened. Met two girls and we ended, we ended up driving back to, uh, to San Juan, so. But uh, we, uh, we went back to the sub and lo and behold, the, uh, all my shipmates were out there saying, where did you find those two girls? Well, it came out to be they were flight attendants from Eastern Airlines. And uh, that, was, uh, that was a real sea story. All right, then uh, I'm just trying to remember the, uh, we went back up to, uh, when we went to San Juan, we went to uh, St. Thomas. Uh, before going back up to Groton, we went to St. Thomas. They were doing a, what they call a springboard exercise where we'd work with other, uh, other uh, ships and uh, the task force down there, what Roosevelt Roads is another Navy base down there. Anyway, we go into the St. Thomas and uh, we were we were both rum drinkers, my friend and my my buddy and I. So we go to the local liquor store, Sparky's, and we bought a bottle of uh, bottle of rum. It was called um, God, was it Ron Rico? Was it Bacardi? It was uh, it was a rum that's brewed right there in in, uh, in Saint Croix. And anyway, we got a bottle of rum. And the rum was a dollar for a quart of rum, one U.S. dollar. And we went to get a bottle of Coca-Cola, one of them 32-ounce bottles of Coke, so we could have rum and Cokes. And the Coke was a dollar sixty. So uh, that was just, the rum was cruising, C R U Z A N, cruising rum. That was the name of the rum from St. Croix. And and even today. They bottle it up and ship it to Jacksonville uh, in, in barrels. And that's where they, uh, they process it and put it into bottles. But you can still buy cruising rum today. Anyhow, then we went back up to, uh, to Groton and um, our next trip was one that we had to go to be at uh, Bar Harbor, Maine on July 4th. 1964 for uh, uh, the 4th of July and we were the guests of honor up there we had a, a Navy destroyer anchored out we were anchored out and it was 58 degrees on the sub on the top side but on the land on the land it was um, 80 degrees so that's the difference in how cold the water is in Bar Harbor Maine as compared to the land. And uh, I had liberty that day, and my buddy and I decided we wanted to do something 
uh, and we'd heard about this Arcadia National Park. So he and I uh, got a ride up to the top of Mount Cadillac and we spent the night up there because we wanted to see the sunset at 4.30 in the morning because that's where the first sun hits the United States is right there on Mount Cadillac in Bar Harbor, Maine. And a friend of mine just went there this year and he said, you couldn't do that now. You need to get a reservation to go up there to watch the sun sunrise. So, and then we left uh, Bar Harbor and we, uh, we went up to um, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And the people in Halifax were just really very, very nice. And um, we saw a lot of the sites, the museums and all, but the, um, as soon as the phone was hooked up, the phone was ringing inviting us to parties because we found out that the female to male ratio in Halifax is like 12 to one. And uh, we asked that night at the party, how come it's 12, well, when, when the guys are old enough, they, just, they leave Halifax and they go down to the States and all us girls were left here in Halifax. So, uh, but a beautiful city and, and a great, uh, great memory for uh, being there for as long as we were. And then we left there and we went back to, uh, to Groton. Well, by that time, it was uh, the fall and I had been studying because in order to get qualified in submarines, you have to learn every compartment from the forward torpedo room to the after torpedo room. And you have a book, and as you learn each compartment, uh, an officer will sign you off. He'll test you and he'll sign you off on where the valves are, where the emergency gear is, and everything about that compartment. And you start on the deck, and then you go down to the uh, forward torpedo room and work your way back. Well, it took me 10 months to uh, complete the entire submarine. And then the officer uh, will walk you through from starting in the beginning, starting in the front for torpedo room, and he'll be asking you questions all the way till you get to the after torpedo room. And he signed me off and I was qualified in submarines. And then the dolphins that I have on here right now are the original ones that Captain pinned on my on my uniform in October 1964. But after that, um, in, uh, in January, they, uh, they came to me and told me that they were transferring from um, the diesel electric submarines to nuclear power, which I knew because the Nautilus had already been commissioned in 1954 and here we are in 1964. And uh, they offered me uh, uh, second class uh, E5 uh, ETB school in San Francisco and nuclear power school. And all I had to do was extend for two more years. But uh, I made a decision after thinking it over that I decided that I just wanted to uh, do my four years and uh, get out of the Navy and just settle down and start a family. And I made a vow that I wasn't gonna get married while I was in the Navy because you just never know where you're gonna end up. Um, so the last trip that I made uh, on the grouper, we went back down to Bermuda again and we went to Puerto Rico and on the way back, we, uh, we got ordered to snorkel. And snorkeling is when you run on the diesel engines, but you're at periscope depth. And it creates a vacuum in the submarine when you do that. And we ran on the snorkel for 14 days, submerged. And uh, 
we uh, were on the snorkel, and at that time I was on the uh, the bow planes in the control room because you would alternate between the bow planes and the stern planes and the helm in the conning tower, and you would just take turns. But I was on the bow planes when the uh, sonar sonarman yelled to the captain got a contact and it's coming right at us well the captain raised the uh, periscope and he yelled emergency dive and they sound that klaxon and boy you know something's wrong when they sound that klaxon emergency dive the boat dive the boat well i got on the bow planes and we did a 30 degree down bubble and it wasn't five minutes later, you hear the freighter going right over the top of the submarine. And uh, so the captain got on the radio and uh, asked the, what are you doing? You know, he asked the freighter, what are you doing? The ship on the surface. And he said, we saw the red light and we thought there was a problem. So we came over to investigate. Well, when you're snorkeling, there's a red light on top of the uh, the snorkel, which is sucking in the uh, the air for the engines. So that was uh, one harrowing experience, but we survived that. And then we uh, we surfaced, and we went on the surface the rest of the way back into uh, into Groton. And that was my uh, my last trip on the grouper, uh, because then in January I got orders. Um, because of Vietnam, um, they were switching, switching uh, people, and uh, somebody came from Charleston, South Carolina, from a guided missile frigate, and uh, he wanted to go to Vietnam, and we switched. So they sent me to the missile frigate DLG-16, the USS Leahy in Charleston, and he went somewhere else in the fleet, but uh, the grouper stayed, uh, stayed active until 1968 when she was decommissioned and retired. But my, then my experience started again in, uh, in Charleston. Uh, I told people all my life I might have been born a Yankee, but I was not meant to live up there. I never, ever liked cold weather. So when I get down to Charleston, the, uh, they were on summer hours, which was a wonderful experience. You, you start work at seven in the morning and at one o'clock you're done for the day. So you go on Liberty. And uh, that was a, a real good time. And Charleston was a beautiful city back in the 60s. And uh, they had two beautiful beaches you could go to, and it was just really a nice place to uh, be on a duty station. Except then, we got orders in uh, November to uh, go to the Mediterranean. So we shipped out right before Thanksgiving and met up with the USS America CVA-66, and we then went to uh, uh, a little island called Mallorca, Palma de Mallorca in the Mediterranean. And we did the change of command there. So the, uh, the ships that were there, they went back to the States and we assumed our, uh, our duties in the Mediterranean. So after Mallorca, we, uh, we pulled into uh, Naples, Italy, and we were gonna spend the, uh, the holidays uh, in, in Naples. And that's when I learned my first two Italian words, Bon Natale. Bon Natale is Merry Christmas in Italian. And uh, it was just, it was cold uh, compared to Charleston, but it wasn't bad. But then they had these tours going uh, from the ship that you could go up to Rome on these tours. And I volunteered for that. And I ended up spending um, Christmas in Rome 
saw the Pope twice, and uh, I ended up going to the Sistine Chapel. And of all the things I've seen in my lifetime, that was the most impressive. I mean, it was just how that man could lay on his back and paint that ceiling is beyond me. I mean, just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful job. And so then we went back, I went back to, we went back, the tour went back to uh, uh, Naples and we were just doing regular duty um, on the ship. And then they had a second trip to Rome after Christmas. And I wanted to go on that also, but they said, no, no, you've already been once, you can't go a second time. Well, two days later, they came out with another trip. And that was to Venice, Italy. And uh, so I put in for that one. And it's funny, when your enlistment's almost up and they're trying to get you to re-enlist, anything you want, you can have. <laughs> carte blanche. So uh, that's what I did. I went to, uh, I volunteered for that and got to go to Italy and I spent New Year's, New Year's Eve in Venice, Italy. And I got to tell you another funny story. Uh, we check into the hotel, uh, my buddy, um, he and I, and we went for a walk out the Piazza de San Marco, which is right there by the hotel. We were staying right on the Grand Canal. And it's hot, funny how you remember stuff, but it was the Savoy Jolanda Hotel on the Grand Canal in Venice, Italy. And we uh, were walking around Piazza de San Marco, and my friend says to me, Ow. I think those women are speaking English over there, American. Really? So I went over and I approached him. You girls from the States? Oh, yeah. So what are you doing here? Well, we're here on a college trip. I said, oh, well, listen, it's New Year's Eve. Uh, why don't you come over to the hotel and we can have a New Year's Eve party? How many of them are you? Well, there's 20 of us. I said, wow, okay, well, this is the hotel. This is where we're staying. So sure enough, here come the girls. All 20 didn't come, only 12. So um, two of the guys on the tour were from the America. One played the banjo, one played the guitar. And we just had a real nice New Year's Eve party with them. So uh, a, a night to remember. It was really a lot of fun. Uh, so then the, uh, the next day, we just, we rested and one of the things you learn in Italy, and they tell you, do not drink the water in Italy. Do not drink the water. So what we did is we drank wine. And we would drink wine breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you just got used to it because that's what they were doing. You know, the, the, the Italians, they were drinking wine all the time. And you could get a liter of wine, which is quite a bit of wine, for... Uh, Back in those days, it was 600 lira to the dollar. That's before the euro. So we could get that for uh, like 50 cents. We could, get, we could get a liter of wine for 50 cents and we, it would last you for three meals, you know, for two people. So then we did all the, did all the museums, went to the, uh, um, all the museums there and everything and uh, it was just really rewarding. I mean, really, to see all that stuff and, and know how old it was and, you know, uh, how religious it was and just the, phenomenal, just really phenomenal. And then uh, we, on the way back to, to, Napo to Naples, uh, we ended up stopping in Florence because that was on the way back to Naples on the bus. and just a beautiful city, really. I think, in my mind, it's prettier than even Rome. It was just a beautiful city, Firenze, Florence. And then back to uh, back to Naples. 
I can't remember any of the highlights from Florence other than the church with the uh, the solid bronze doors. I mean, just still still is in my mind. And I remember it. But anyway, we get we get back to uh, we get back to Naples, and then right after the first of the year, we went from there back up. We went up to uh, Livorno uh, to Pisa, and uh, we saw the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And then from there, we go up to where Chris, Christopher Columbus came from, from Genoa. And we're in Genoa, and the Cary America is there anchored out. And we're in there uh, at the pier. And here comes the American Express people. And they said, who would like to go to Germany for the Mardi Gras? And uh, I said, well, I'd like to go, but how much is it? And they said, well, you got to take a week, you got to have a week's leave, and it's going to cost seventy-five dollars to go on to go on on this tour. And uh, so I put in my request, you know, with uh, the captain, and uh, lo and behold, they say you can go. So I, all right, so I paid my seventy-five dollars, and then. All of us sailors went out to the train station and we took the train from Genoa up to Milano. And then we caught the Rome Hamburg Express from, it came out of Rome and was going to Hamburg, Germany. And we took that into Austria. And now we're in February of uh, 1965. And no, 66 just celebrated New Year's Eve. So we're in 66 in February. And uh, we get on the train in Milano and we had our own pr private rail car. It was beautiful. And, uh, but they told us we can't wear our uniforms in Austria. So we had to take off our tops and just have our Navy sweaters. And it was just spectacular. I mean, the Alps and the mountains and the snow and just beautiful, beautiful country and just clean and just beautiful, really. So we finally get into uh, to Munich and here again I can remember the hotel. That's funny. It's the Hotel Daniel on Sonnestrasen in Munich, Germany. And we were determined to go to uh, the Hofbrau House, which was one of the beer halls there in Munich. And uh, lo and behold, I liked a good beer back in the day, but no one told me that that German beer was as strong as it was. Because, I mean, two beers, and I, two beers and I was gone. I mean, and the beers are like in these big steins and, and they, the girl comes and she's got them into her chest and she just throws them on the table there and I'll tell you, I had one, and I thought, I, I can't be really feeling that already, but I was. So I had the second one, and uh, it was just, we were just up uh, dancing, and, and everything it was a wonderful experience. And then the, uh, I slept in the next day uh, because we could go sightseeing, and then the following day, they had the trip going from Munich down to uh, Garmisch and Oberammergau and Prince Ludwig's castle. And uh, Oberammergau is where they had the Passion Play every 10 years with the uh, crucifixion of Christ. And uh, it was just beautiful country. And then we saw where the Olympics were in 19, 1936 or 37. I forget which year that was, but it's right there. Uh, in uh, in Garmisch, and uh, we went to the castle. Cold, cold. I mean, absolutely cold. Because back then, the only heat they had was the fireplaces, and the fireplace was not lit. <laughs> but it was just fun to see the castle, and then back to Munich. Uh, Munich to uh, Munich back to uh, Genoa, and then uh, 
We pulled out of Genoa and we were supposed to go to Sardinia. And we were doing something in Sardinia, but they said no liberty, no liberty in Sardinia. So we said, all right. But then uh, somebody from Sardinia, from Obia, Sardinia came out to the ship and said that they were having uh, an opera that night and in, they invited us to go as their guest to the opera. And uh, I said, well, if it gets me off the ship, why not volunteer to go to the opera? You know, I had never been to an opera before. So we uh, uh, volunteered for that. And sure enough, we get off the, uh, the launch that took us to, into, the, into the city, to Albia. And there's a bus there. And they said, something has happened. And they canceled the opera. <laughs> so we had liberty. We had liberty in, in Obia. And uh, we got to see the town. And uh, just, just really enjoyed seeing the sights. It was something else that, you know, that we hadn't seen before. I hadn't seen before. And back to the ship. Well, then the next, the next thing, we were in... Uh, in Mallorca again, where we had started. And Palma Mallorca is a Spanish island and it's halfway between um, Italy and Barcelona, Spain. It's 185 miles southeast of Barcelona, Spain. Beautiful, beautiful island. And it's like the Caribbean for the Scandinavian people. They, uh, they vacation there and uh, they, uh, they come down in droves, and, and right now we were like, it was, we were into March. And uh, so we had liberty in, uh, in Palma, Mallorca. And we, uh, the beaches there were just beautiful, really beautiful. And then we were back to the ship, and our next port of call was Athens, Greece. And that was uh, the port of Piraeus. And the captain, the captain was a Greek, and he was looking forward to it. And this is February 1966. And what happened, we were underway, and we were heading toward uh, Athens, and we got an emergency communication came in that we were directed to go uh, towards Gibraltar. And we didn't know what was going on because the captain was really disappointed he couldn't go to Athens, Greece. But what had happened, um, two Air Force planes had collided uh, by refueling over the Mediterranean. And uh, they had dropped five, four hydrogen bombs Three of the bombs landed on the land, and uh, one of them they couldn't find. The fourth one they couldn't find. And uh, finally a fisherman came forward and said that he saw where it went down. And they said, how can, how can this guy know where it went down? You know, we can't find it. But he was, he was from the area, and he knew where the bomb went down. So they changed the search area. Sure enough, the second day, they found the fourth hydrogen bomb. And they made a movie um, with Cuba Gooding Jr. and Robert De Niro about the first African-American uh, diver. And he's the one that goes down and retrieves the, uh, the hydrogen bomb. And uh, that was the beginning of the movie. Anyhow, um, so, we ended up going back to Mallorca, and then we headed. We changed uh, again because we had been there six months on deployment, and then we headed back to uh, Charleston, South Carolina. When we were en route back to Charleston, South Carolina, um, I was a short timer then because I was getting out in April of '66. And it's funny because 
we were just passing Bermuda, heading for Charleston, when uh, the radio man comes and says, Herring, guess what? Your, your two weeks just turned into four months in two weeks. What are you talking about? They involuntarily extended us because of Vietnam. So I wasn't getting out in April. Um, so I, I was supposed to get out uh, four months later in August. And uh, two months Two months later, in June, we uh, they phased it out, and they said you only have to do three months instead of four months extra. And I ended up my discharge would have come due on a Sunday, so I got out on a on a Friday. And uh, so I did four years, two months, and 28 days, and uh, got discharged. Uh, 15 June 1966 and I was determined that this was my opportunity I had 30 days to get my job back in the jewelry business in Trenton New Jersey so I decided I'm gonna go and uh, drive cross country and the woman who took us out of the orphanage back in 1950 Five, she was living in Tucson, Arizona, and I was determined to go see her. So I drove from Charleston, South Carolina to Tucson, and uh, I spent a week with her, and uh, she had a, a to-do list for me when I got there. And it was funny because I, I did all the things, and then my next stop was San Francisco. And uh, I had met a girl in St. Thomas who was from San Francisco. And we were communicating back and forth and she invited me to San Francisco after I got out of the Navy. So I went to see her in San Francisco. And uh, her father was trying to be a matchmaker because he said, um, I know you like my daughter and she likes you and I'm the vice president of the Wells Fargo Bank of California. And back in 66, that's what it was, the Wells Fargo Bank of California. They were just in California. And uh, he said, if you marry my daughter, um, you'll have my job one day. You'll be in the banking business. Which I thought, wow, that's quite an offer, you know? I said, well, listen, I'm, I'm heading back to New Jersey and uh, I think I'm gonna work through Christmas and then I'll have some money and uh, I'll come back to San Francisco. He said, okay. So back in those days, of course, you didn't have any kind of cell phones. You had to communicate really with a pay phone or you would write. So I left there and then I headed up uh, into Reno, Nevada, over to uh, Utah. And in Utah, I was trying to cover as many states as I could. And uh, I uh, touched Montana into Yellowstone. And uh, I went through Yellowstone, saw Old Faithful, and then continued right across into Custer, South Dakota, over the mountains to uh, Mount Rushmore. And I got there like at nine o'clock in the morning. And just a, to see it for the first time, you know, it, it just very impressive. And I just stood there and took some pictures and, and looked at it and whew, just marveled at it. And then I went into the restaurant to get uh, get breakfast. When I came out, it was all fogged in. Couldn't see it. So I'm I glad that I stopped before breakfast and got to see it, you know, just the way it should be seen. 
So I left there and I drove then to uh, the Badlands of South Dakota. I went into uh, Minnesota, down to Wisconsin, and down to Chicago to see uh, another girl that I had met while I was stationed there at ET school. And uh, she was a school teacher that uh, had picked me up hitchhiking home for Christmas in 1962. And uh, we communicated by writing. Uh, and, and then when I came back from Christmas holidays, she uh, invited me to come visit her in Chicago, which I did. And then we started dating. And lo and behold, uh, I left there to go to sub school in October of uh, 63. And when I called her, because I was going to go back for Christmas, when I called her, she had met somebody else and uh, was getting married. And I wished her well. Diane Hall. Diane Hall. Anyhow, when I came back through from uh, Mount Rushmore and through uh, Wisconsin back to Chicago, I called her. And uh, at the old number that I had, and I got her mother on the phone. Her mother says, Diane just had a baby girl. Here's her new number. Call her. So I called Diane and she was blown away. You know, she hadn't heard my voice for, you know, for years. So I left in 63 and here we are in 66. And uh, she says, come on over, let's get, let's have some lunch. And I said, Diane, I just want to remember you the way you were, the way, you know, what we had back then. And uh, I'll always remember you, how you saved my life, picking me up hitchhiking in the, in the blizzard of uh, 62. Anyhow, so I left her and I went back to uh, Trenton, New Jersey, where I graduated high school and went back in the jewelry business. And lo and behold, I was back about a month when uh, this beautiful blonde girl came to the jewelry counter and we started a conversation. And I said, do you work in the store here? She said, yeah, I'm in the credit department. Okay. So next thing you know, I asked her on a date. And the next thing you know, we're getting married. So we got married after the Christmas selling season, which was December 31st, 1966. And uh, that was good. It was good anyway. Uh, we had a baby girl, um, her name was Heidi. She was born August the 1st, 1967. And I was still in the jewelry business until uh, somebody came by the jewelry counter one day and said, we're looking for someone to manage the jewelry store. And I said, where? And it was Gordon's Jewelers. And uh, he offered me a lot of money. And back then, you know, I'm, I'm a struggling guy, just out of the Navy and got a wife and a, and a daughter. And I took his offer and I managed uh, the jewelry store in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. And then what happened is that I was, doing real good, making my figures and stuff. And they wanted me to go to another jewelry store that needed uh, some help because the manager was retiring. And so I had to transfer up to Lebanon, Pennsylvania to another Gordon's Jewelers. But I didn't like being, being transferred like that. You know, I wanted to settle down. So lo and behold, I get a phone call 
from my old boss in Trenton, New Jersey, saying that he worked for a company in Philadelphia and they were looking for a diamond and jewelry salesman. And uh, so I called them up and they wanted to interview me. So I went and interviewed with them and uh, they hired me at a very, very good rate, a good salary, but I would be stable. I would just be working there in Philadelphia, which was only a stone's throw from Trenton, New Jersey. And it was called Block Jewelers and Distributors. And uh, I really liked, liked, it was a family business. It was just two brothers, uh, Alfred Block and Byron Block, and Byron Block was my boss. And uh, I was doing real, real good. And I uh, was happy. And then um, uh, my, the jewelry buyer for the company, they had four stores. The jewelry buyer for the company took a position in New York with a jewelry company. And Byron Block came to me and he said, Albert, I'm very impressed with you and I don't want to go outside and find someone else to be my jewelry buyer. I'd like to offer you the opportunity to be my jewelry buyer. And I said, I'm honored, really. And uh, I was 30 years old back then and I became the jewelry buyer for Block Jewelers and Distributors in Philadelphia. And I did that for five years and then Byron's son, uh, Ricky Block, he came into the business and I could see the handwriting on the wall. <laughs> Ricky Block was going to be the new jewelry buyer eventually. Well, but in the meantime, he was just doing other things. And Ricky was a great guy. And I just loved Byron Block. He was a, he was a colonel in uh, World War II and uh, just a smart man. And uh, I got an opportunity to go work for a company in Rockville, Maryland, uh, W. Bell & Company, as a jewelry buyer. And uh, so I went down and applied for that job, and I got that job with a lot more money, but I'd have to move from where I was down to uh, a little town called Frederick, Maryland, which is right near Camp David. It's in the uh, Maryland Mountains. And that's another word I learned, the Catoctin Mountains. And uh, just a beautiful little town. And uh, I went to work for uh, W. Bell & Company as their jewelry buyer. And then unfortunately, uh, my wife, God bless her, Gabrielle, uh, I met somebody else and she told me she got married too young and uh, would, had to be more to life than this and she left me. So uh, then here I am in Frederick, Maryland. And, uh, but she, uh, she had taken my, uh, our daughter to raise because at that time I had decided to become a road salesman. And by a road salesman, I mean that I work for a jewelry company and I would go call on retail jewelers and, uh, sell them merchandise. And I got hooked up with this one company called uh, Rand and Paseca and Jules Rand and pheno another phenomenal man. He reminded me so much of Byron Block, really. And he took a liking to me and he gave me a nice territory and I went out and sold crosses and medals for him for 30 years. So in the meantime, I'm a single guy 
living in Frederick, Maryland. And uh, I had a dog. Uh, he was a shepherd and uh, collie mix. His name was Jocko. Jocko weighed 125 pounds. And I didn't know how I was going to travel and take care of Jocko, but the, uh, the family next door had a daughter and she agreed to come feed him. And Jocko lived in, the, uh, in my camper, in the Volkswagen camper in the garage. That was his thing. And he would just stay. We had, uh, we had an acre there and uh, up on Braddock Mountain and she came and fed him and then lo and behold uh, I met this uh, singles bar one night and I met somebody else who was in my situation he had gone through a divorce and we we hit it off and uh, his name was Bill Hagus and uh, I'd known him for a couple of months and he says to me, Al, I need a place to stay because I have to get out of the house because I'm going through a divorce. And I said, oh, okay, can I come stay with you? And I said, you know, you could solve all my problems and take care of my dog. <laughs> so, so Bill Hagis moved in on a temporary basis in uh, December of 1979, 1979, and he was there, and in September of 79, I had just done a jewelry show in Baltimore, and I uh, was determined to go see this 50s rock and roll group called the Flamingos. They were appearing at a local uh, night spot at the Sheridan Hotel in the lounge area. So I came home, I showered, got dressed, and went over to the Sheridan. And uh, I was enjoying the, the Flamingos entertaining and all of a sudden, they, they stopped playing and singing, and they said, we need two volunteers to do the jitterbug. And they pointed to me and this blonde woman who was sitting to my left with another woman. And we got up to dance, and you thought we'd been dancing together for 10 years. We just clicked. And I'm thinking, wow. This is one beautiful woman here. And uh, then she started talking to me. I went over to the tent where they were sitting, offered to buy her a drink while she had a Southern accent that sugar wouldn't melt in her mouth, let me tell you. Absolutely. I'm flabbergasted at this woman. So, Back then, the lounges closed at one o'clock, and uh, I said, can I take you to breakfast? And she said, okay, I gotta take my girlfriend home first, but I'll meet you over at, the, over at Denny's. And I said, okay. So I go over to Denny's, and instead of going into the restaurant, I got out of the car and I just stood there. And here she comes and she pulls up and uh, she was just really uh, so beautiful. So we go in, and by now it's almost two o'clock, and uh, we start, we order something to eat, and we're talking and talking, and it was like ships passing in the night. We had mutual friends, and we had belonged to this organization called Parents Without Partners, PWP. And uh, I said, well, did you go to the Valentine's party? She said, no, I, went, I didn't. I went to the other party? No, I didn't go to that one. And uh, anyhow, uh, she left and I left. We made a, I said, I'll call you on Thursday. 
Well, uh, what was happening was that was Sunday night. Monday, I had to go to Pittsburgh to uh, sell jewelry. And when I go to Pittsburgh, I'm there until Friday. And then I, I come home Friday. But Thursday, I called her Thursday and said, can we go out tomorrow night? And she said, I was hoping you were going to call. And yes. So we went out. Uh, I got home Friday. We went out Friday night. And then Saturday, the parents with our partners was having a hayride. And we did that together. Well, the next thing you know, we're dating on a regular basis. And in June of 1981, I proposed to her in a hotel room in Baltimore during a jewelry show. Got down on one knee and proposed. And as of today, we're married 40 years. It'll be 41 years, December the 5th. And she, uh, she got permission to marry a Yankee because she was from Southern Virginia, but her accent is North Carolina. But you never met a more intelligent, affectionate woman than Jane Bobbitt Wilkerson. I mean, unbelievable. The Lord bless me. It's funny how I tell a story that after my first wife left me, I went to the computer and I sent an email to God and I said, Dear Lord, yeah, I don't like being alone. Could you please find me a woman who is blonde and a very affectionate and maybe a southern accent? And it wasn't five minutes later, I got an email back from the Lord and he said, Albert, you're in luck. She's right there in Frederick County, Maryland, where you live but now I have to arrange for you two to meet. And uh, we met at that Flamingos thing. And it's funny because we were married in 81 and three years later, we were in Ocean City, Maryland and who's appearing but the Flamingos. So we went there and we told them how we had met at their thing three years pr prior to that. You know, and they got a big charge out of it really. So. Uh, I said, so you guys are matchmakers and didn't know it. So, but then uh, Jane and I were together in Frederick and uh, she uh, was in real estate. And she came to me one day and she says, Albert, real estate's really booming here in, in Frederick, Maryland. And I'd like to open my own business do I have your blessing? And I said, you sure do. So she opened her own real estate, Action Plus Real Estate in Frederick, Maryland. And uh, we were just very happy together, really. We just, we, we traveled together, we did things together. Um, but then uh, uh, the real estate business sort of slowed up and my cousin, Donald Herring, uh, retired, he was 82nd Airborne. He retired from the New York Police Department, NYPD, with 20 years. And uh, he had moved to Naples, Florida. And Jane and I were doing a jewelry show in Miami Beach, and he invited us over. Well, we'd never been to the west coast of Florida before. So we go over to see him and he just built a house in Naples and we liked it. We liked the West Coast of Florida. And uh, he uh, he said, well, look around. You, may, you might like something here. So we looked around in Naples, looked at the condos and looked at the prices. And we had dinner that night and uh, he said, would you find anything? I said, Donald, let me tell you, it's expensive here. And we're talking um, 1986, 
and it was expensive back then compared to what it is now. It's even more so. But anyway, couldn't find anything. He said, you know what? You may like Marco Island. He said, go down 41 to 951. Take the bridge over it and you'll be on Marco Island. You may like that a little better. It's, it's a developing area. So the next morning we get up. We were staying at a hotel there in Naples. We get up, we drive down 41, made the right turn on 951. When we got to the top of the bridge, it was really eerie because I turned my head to look at Jane and she was looking at me and we said, this is it. So we bought a condo on Marco Island the next day. Just loved the place, loved it. Except that we were going back and forth um, six times a year. But the good part about it was uh, we didn't come, we came down for Christmas and then New Year's Day we would leave and we'd rent it out to different people. And the rental agency would rent it out for us. And so we were making money on this condo on Marco Island. And then we decided, you know what? It's going back and forth is too much. Let's move to Florida. Well, in 1994, I had just turned 53 and I had 200 customers in Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia, jewelry customers that I've been selling. And I said, Jane, if I do this, I have to start all over, you know, in Florida. I, but I'm willing to do it because I just love Florida. So we, uh, we came down and uh, we bought a house in Venice East and uh, we were, we were just gonna buy this house until we could sell our house in Maryland and see where we wanted to live in the area. You know, we, we, we spent one winter on Siesta Key, but that was too busy and too hectic. So we didn't wanna go there, so we ended up in Venice and then we bought a house in Venice East and she said, this is just temporary till we find where we want to live. And this is June of uh, 94. So we moved down. And of course, when you move from the north, you have all this furniture and stuff. So we had to store all our furniture in, uh, in the garage. But she just loved this house. It was on a, a lake. And uh, that's another funny story. We, when we moved in, we pulled up with the U-Haul van in front of the house and our grandson was there to help us move in. He uh, goes out the back of the house and he comes running and screaming, grandmother, grandmother, you got two alligators back here. I said, Marvin, do not scare your grandmother like that. I mean, really, you know? He said, no, no, there's two alligators back here. So I walked back and I look, there was two alligators back there, but they were on the other side of the lake. And as long as we lived there, them alligators stayed on the other side of the lake. They never came on our side. Um, but uh, we lived there until um, 2000. So this temporary move was six years we lived in the house. And another funny part of the story was that uh, her girlfriend came down from Maryland with her husband to visit us and she fell in love with the house. So she says, if you ever decide you, you're gonna sell, let me know because I like this house. So we said, okay, well next, guess what? Um, the following year, um, I'm looking in the paper and I see this house for sale in Chestnut Creek. And uh, I called the realtor up and I said, I'd like to look at the house tomorrow. And Jane and I went and looked at it. We got to the front door and I said, Jane, this is it. My dream house was, has always been when you go to the front door, you open the front door, look right through the living room at the pool. And that's how this house was. 
and there was nobody behind us. It's on a green belt. So there's no complete privacy. So we bought that and moved in in June of 2000. And this is uh, uh, September of 22. We're in the house 22 years. And it's just as beautiful as it was when we bought it 22 years ago. But then her girlfriend comes down with her husband and says, well, we're not sure we'd like to buy, but we'd like to rent. Okay, so we rented it to them for a year. They were in there six months and decided they wanted to buy it. And unfortunately, he passed away last year, but she's still living in that same house that she fell in love with back in uh, 95. So, so that's, I guess, brings up to date what I'm, well, I could, I could finish uh, with a little bit um, back uh, my last year, I, ret um, I retired, I worked till I was 78 years old. So in 2019, um, I told everybody this is my last year of working on the road as a, a whole jewelry wholesaler that I wanted to retire. And what was happening to me is I had two bad knees. Um, I had uh, uh, arthritis real bad in my left knee and in my right knee. And um, I struggled my last year, 2019, because I, I just couldn't take cold, cold weather at all. And I, when I have to go to, up to Atlanta to Georgia to do a jewelry show and all, it just killed me to go up in October and November to, to Georgia. I just, it just really, it would take me two, two and a half hours in the morning to get ready to go to an appointment. But I made it. I made it until uh, um, December 2019. And then uh, I had my left knee replaced by Dr. John Paul Vidalin here in Venice. And uh, the man is just a phenomenal surgeon. He had me up and walking the same day they replaced my knee. And uh, in 30 days, it was as good as new, really, uh, with titanium. And then we went to do the right knee, and that's when COVID hit in uh, 2020. So we couldn't get uh, the surgery done until June. So that I had the right knee done in June of uh, 2020. And uh, so uh, now I have two new knees and uh, I'm enjoying life in Florida and living the good life, except that uh, uh, next month I'll be uh, 81 and my wife, God bless her, Jane, will be 84. And uh, Jane's had a lot of health problems, but we're just taking it one day at a time. So. Uh, I left out some other parts though that uh, how the Lord has blessed me with my life uh, from the orphanage right through uh, right through meeting Jane and getting in the jewelry business and just traveling because I enjoyed the uh, the jewelry business because I would do jewelry shows in Nashville and go to the Grand Old Opry. I'd do jewelry shows in uh, uh, Seattle and when I went to do the jewelry show in Seattle and I went out three days early because I wanted to go to Everett Washington because uh, I learned to fly in Frederick Maryland in 1985 and I just loved Boeing planes and whenever I flew on a 727 or a 737 or a 757, I mean, I just loved them. But when I toured the Boeing factory in Everett, Washington, and I got to see the Dreamliner, the 787, whew, man, what a plane, what a plane. Carbon fiber material, stronger than steel, lighter than aluminum, just a great plane. So uh, 
I miss flying, but what happens is that if you don't fly all the time, you're not good. I mean, you gotta when you're up there flying, you just gotta be on, on top of your game. I mean, because you gotta be prepared for any situation or anything. And uh, your your age, you you're not as sharp. And you, you have to realize it. So, so I stopped flying. Uh, when I turned uh, uh, 60, uh, but I can still drive pretty good. <laughs> so, so that's another part of the story that uh, uh, I like the Venice Airport. Uh, I just watched the planes. One of my customers, uh, he's got a plane. He came over here to have lunch with us one day, and that was a fun experience. But uh, I'm just loving life in Florida, and. This is, I've always called this the promised land, okay? And it's, uh, people have said, well, Al, that's God's waiting room. I said, yeah, but it's a real nice waiting room, really, just beautiful. And now we're getting, we're getting more people to live here like you, Matt, you know, big younger people. It's not just us old people anymore, you know? Our, uh, our son, Randy, is here, and uh, he works for Goodwill, and uh, he loves Florida. He's in our right in our Chestnut Creek subdivision. And my sister, she came from San Francisco and retired in 2003. And she's been here ever since, and she loves Venice, Florida too, so. And uh, we just had the good fortune of getting a beautiful new hospital right up here in Laurel Road, the Sarasota Memorial Hospital. So uh, if we were thinking about moving anywhere south, that changed our mind because I mean, anything happens to either one of us health-wise, and my wife has already had to go because uh, her blood work came back uh, that her hemoglobin was down to 6.6. .6. So they had to, we had to rush her up there to get uh, uh, two units of blood. And, uh, but they're first class. And just to get a plug in here for my for my doctor, he's the uh, chief of staff there, is uh, Dr. Christopher, uh, there we go, Christopher Jefferson, Dr. Christopher Jefferson, yeah, he's chief of staff there. He's been my doctor for 20 years. But uh, I've been blessed with a good memory, as maybe you can tell from my testimonial here, uh, and it's all up in my hard drive. But the, uh, the hard drive's getting overloaded, but uh, it's still working pretty good, okay? That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Wow. Remarkable, honestly. Especially just the way everything turned out. I know. For you. And um, I do have some uh, questions pertaining to your time in the service. Yeah. As you mentioned, uh, to me off camera, your brother was drafted into Vietnam. No, no. Oh, sorry. He enlisted right out of high school. He enlisted and then yeah. went into Vietnam. He was his, his, he was on a CUR uh, CVA 64, the Constellation. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, ended up going to uh, Vietnam. And he has the Gulf of Tonkin medal from uh, that uh, deployment. Were you able to stay in touch with your family? Uh, whether it was your father, um, the woman who got you out of the orphanage, your sister, or your brother during your service? Yes. As yeah, a matter of fact, um, my, uh, my sister and brother, we were all in Trenton, New Jersey, because the woman that took us out of the orphanage, her name was Margaret Ross. Uh, God bless you. Uh, she's... Uh, in Tucson, Arizona, in a, I guess a, a store, I call them storage lockers. But you know, when you're cremated, and that's what my wife and I are gonna do, we're gonna be in a storage locker up at Sarasota National Cemetery, and that's where my brother is. But my sister, um, she's still here, uh, but she was in San Francisco. When, uh, when Jane and I got married in 81, uh, our honeymoon was San Francisco, Hawaii, Las Vegas, and back. We, uh, we planned a great honeymoon. 
and my sister didn't come to the wedding, so we got to see her when we flew to San Francisco, and then Jane got to meet her for the first time. And in 2003, she came for Easter um, to stay with us, to visit with us, and she went for a walk, and she met somebody who was selling their house in Chestnut Creek, and she went to, inside to look at it, and she bought it and retired here. She bought, she bought the house in, uh, in June of 63, of, uh, in uh, June of 2003, and then she, they rented it back from her until she finally retired in September of uh, 2003. But then she went to work for the Board of Education after 37 years with the Postal Inspectors Division. And uh, she worked for the school board for nine years and then finally retired. So. You also, uh, before we started our interview, we went through some of your photos and there were some people that you have photos of that you actually still keep in touch with. And uh, could you elaborate on who they are and yeah. why you still keep in touch? And well, it's the grouper. Um, we, we had a reunion um, every year or every other year. And the first one that I went to was in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, because the USS, um, okay, Albert, USS Razorback is right there on the Arkansas River, right across from uh, the Presidential Library for William Jefferson Clinton. And uh, we had our reunion there for the grouper. And we probably had 40 guys come to the reunion. The last reunion we had was at the Submarine Veterans Convention in Orlando, Florida, um, last year in 2021, which is where that bag is from. And we had it at the uh, Shingle Creek, Rosen Shingle Creek Resort. And we had 10 guys there. And. Um, a lot of the, a uh, lot of my shipmates that were in the top bunks on the submarine, they're all dead. They died first. And why the top bunks? Because on the top bunk, you were that far from the asbestos in the ceiling. All the submarines were lined with asbestos. And when that submarine shook, that white powder just came right down on the top bunks. And uh, they all died of cancer, every one of them, the ones that I knew. But uh, I never thought about it until recently. They just, where's, where's, where's Sheffy? Where's so-and-so? Where's Grisky? You know, they were in the top bunk. And, uh, but uh, good memories from my Naval service, I mean, I was proud to serve. Uh, I joined the Navy to see the world, they didn't disappoint me. And, uh, but I still keep in touch with my shipmates. Matter of fact, uh, the one friend that I made uh, in 1965, Dave Bender. Dave Bender was another ET, and uh, he lived in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and we have been friends for 55 years. And Dave's coming down to visit with me the 29th of this month, and uh, because he ended up going to Vietnam, he is uh, 100% disabled. He's got a few medical problems, but he's, uh, I'll be 81, and his birthday is October the 12th, I'm the 15th, and he'll be 78. But we're meeting in, uh, we're all going to Orlando, and we meet once a year, right there by Disney World at the uh, motel there, and we just sit around and tell sea stories for uh, 
three days. So the reunion is October 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. And then the 4th, we have the dinner that evening, and we all say goodbye to each other and pray for a visit next year. And so, but, uh, and we've been having it because in Orlando, we used to go to different places. We had it in Nashville one year. We had it in Myrtle Beach another year. But it seems all our shipmates ended up in Florida. They're either in Fort Myers or they're in Port Charlotte. Or like me, uh, I'm here in Venice. And then the torpedo man in that one picture, uh, Rick Richter, he's in the villages. And uh, the other guy uh, in the picture, um, Don Brown, he's in Orlando. And uh, so we're all here in Florida, just enjoying the, uh, the good life, so. It's not a bad place to be. Well, it's a lot better than the Bronx, let me tell you. When you were on the ship, uh, either the sub or the frigate, when you weren't doing duty on the ship, uh, what, what kind of things did you do to pass time um, to keep yourself busy recreationally or uh, you know, whatever you and your buddies did? I wrote letters and I, matter of fact, uh, the girlfriend from Chicago, I had two of them and this one, uh, last month in August, I get a letter, I get a letter from uh, someone I didn't recognize the name and uh, I opened it up and I read it and in there were three postcards that I had sent her from uh, from Naples Italy from Venice Italy and from Germany on my on my tours on my trips that I had done and she had been saving them for 50 years. And it's funny because when I came back to Chicago um, on my cross country trip, I uh, went to see her, but her, she was not there. Her, I saw her mother and her father and her name was uh, Sarah, Sarah Halavity. And in the letter she sent me, she said that she had met someone. This is in 66 when I went by there. In 1970, she had met someone and got married. And he had just passed away in 2014. So she was married to him for 44 years and had two children. And I, don't, I didn't get, she didn't tell me in the letter, but both her children had passed away. So she's by herself now. And when I met her, she was living in Cicero, Illinois, which is a little suburb west of Chicago, but west of the downtown. But they, she had moved closer out, a little further out in Bloomfield, Illinois, which is another like 10 or 12 miles west of Cicero. And uh, she was in an apartment building there by herself. You know? And uh, she is 77, yeah. But she's had a good life, I guess. I haven't. I was going to write her, return, write a letter to her. I tried to call her, but she didn't return the call. But uh, Jane told me. My Jane says, uh, write her another letter. And I think I will. And. Uh, in the future here, I'll do, I'll do it, because I have a lot I want to explain to her. Because she, she, from the letter that I got, she thinks like I deserted her, but I didn't. And, but in sending her the postcards, and my wife read them and my sister read them, she says, Al, it doesn't sound like she, you were in love with her, it just sounds like she was a good friend, you know? And that's what she was, a good friend. Um, the other one, this Diane Hall, she was the, she was the one, Whew, my word. But I'm glad she met somebody. Uh, there's a, you know Paul Harvey? 
No. Paul Harvey was a newscaster and his thing was, and the rest of the story, the rest of the story is that I'm on uh, the computer and uh, I got an email and I opened up the email and it said, Albert, you may not remember me, but my name is Diane Hall from Chicago. I wrote back and I said, Diane, you saved my life. I mean, I was literally in the middle of a blizzard hitchhiking to get home for Christmas. And she was coming home from college with another classmate and he was driving and I'm under a light and uh, the car went, went, went by and slowed up and then I watched it go up and then it turned around, came back, turned around again, it came up and stopped. And the window went down and they said, uh, where are you going, sailor? I said, I'm trying to get to Chicago. And uh, they said, we're going to Chicago, so hop in. So he was driving, there was a woman in the passenger seat, and I get in the back seat, another woman was back there. And uh, her name was Diane Hall. And we're talking the whole time where he's driving us to Chicago. And she said, uh, where are you going to be stationed? I said, I'm, gonna be, I'm stationed up at Great Lakes Naval Training Center. She said, oh, really? Well, I'm not, I'm not too far from there. Why don't you give me a call when you get back after Christmas, after New Year's? And I said, okay. Nobody had a piece of paper and nobody had a, a pen all the, way, all the way to Chicago. I said, well, just tell me your phone number and I'll remember it told me her phone number and uh, I finally got home Christmas I got home Christmas Day at three o'clock in the morning as I hitchhiked the next day to get to Trenton New Jersey and luckily my sister left the front door open and uh, I spent Christmas with them and uh, so I go back to uh, Great Lakes and Right after the first of the year, I'm back in school. I had the number up here. I was always good with numbers, remembering numbers. So I, I called her up and I said, Diane, this is uh, Al Herring we met. She said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When's your next Liberty? I said, well, I'm off this weekend. She says, well, here's my, uh, here's my address, you know. Um, Let's do something. I said, okay. So I'll show you around Chicago. I said, okay. So we, uh, at that weekend, there was a railroad that used to run from the Navy base to Chicago called the North Shore Railroad. And it was just like an elevated train. And it would start at Great Lakes Naval Training Center. It would go down right along the ship around the, uh, the lakefront and end up as an elevated train in Chicago. And uh, so I got to see her. And she took me to all the museums and stuff, the Prudential Building and all over Chicago. And, and now we're talking, this is January. My God, was it cold. Man, and I don't like cold weather. Anyway, we dated until she came to my graduation from ET school, from electronics technician school in October. And I was supposed to go back, like I told you, Christmas time, but she had met somebody. Well, getting back to the email, um, I told her where I was and everything. And she said, Al, we're coming to Florida, you know, in two months. Can we get together? Well, God bless my Jane. Um, she's a great woman, an affectionate woman, but she's a jealous woman, okay? And when she heard my old girlfriend's coming, it's, well, she's coming with her husband, you know, really, you know? So we, uh, she came, and you could just see the icicles in the air, you know? 
we, we went to Sharky's for lunch. And uh, so uh, I got to meet her husband. And I said, Diane, you did real good. This guy is just like me. He, re he really was. He really was. She had a great husband. He was retired um, law enforcement. And that's how she found me. He was, uh, he, was doing pe he was doing classmates for a high school reunion. And she said, here, see if you can find Al Herring, Albert Herring. Well, the next morning, they're having breakfast. And she said, well, did you find him? She said, he said, oh yeah, I found him. He's in Venice, Florida. Typical sailor, girl in every port. But I, but I'll tell you this one. Oh my, she's just one fan. I mean, she's just like I said. I, I went to the computer and I sent this to the to the Lord what I wanted, and there she was, just a fan. Smart. I mean, smart, but really affectionate. I mean, phew, very affectionate woman, and she takes very good care of me. I mean, you, I couldn't ask for anybody else. I mean, really. And when I used to travel, you know, you had the opportunity if you wanted to stray or whatever. Not me, no. And she said, don't ever let me catch you. I said, Jane, you'll never catch me because I'm not going to do it. I said, men only do that when they don't, when, when they don't have it at home. And I've got it at home with you. And I used to just look forward to coming home Friday night and being with her. And as I got control of my new surroundings and made new customers, I, I, uh, I worked till Thanksgiving. And then I'm off the entire month of December. And then we would go to Aruba the first week of January. For 22 years we did that for free. Airfare hotel courtesy of Marriott, because all the time I'm traveling, I'm racking up these Marriott points. In 22 years, we did that. Wow. Yeah. And every summer, we do something different. You know, we, uh, we uh, went to uh, Alaska twice, two Alaska cruises, 2004 and 2007. We did it in 2004 and just loved it and then in 2007 i met my dad she's on the she said al the alaska cruise is 999 dollars i said yeah but that's in may she said no it's july i said well then it's an inside stateroom no it's it's a balcony stateroom they were running a special for senior citizens so we booked it again in 2007 and went again and just Thoroughly enjoyed it a second time, really. So, the only place I haven't been that I'd like to go is Glacier National Park. You know where that is? Nope. Montana. Montana. I just touched Montana in going into Yellowstone. You go through a little bit, because I've been to all 50 states. But um, the one place that was on my bucket list to go to was the Dry Tortugas. So where are the Dry Tortugas? I don't know. It's a national park. If this is Key West, over here is Key West, you go 75 miles west into the Gulf, that's the Dry Tortugas. And what's there? Fort Jefferson. So what's famous about Fort Jefferson is that when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in April 1865, the assassin was John Wilkes Booth. And he jumped from the balcony to the stage and broke his leg. And his, his escape was to Waldorf, Maryland. And going through Waldorf, Maryland, he saw a sign for a doctor, Dr. Samuel Mudd. And he stopped in there 
and the doctor set his leg for him. And he continued to, on his merry way, he was trying to get down to Southern Maryland to get across the Potomac to go back to Virginia, to get back to the Confederacy. And uh, so then the uh, Union forces found out who had, treated, who had treated his leg and they arrested him for conspiracy. And he was sentenced to prison. Fort Jefferson in the Dry Tortugas. And he was there in prison when all the, uh, the federal troops, they, uh, they caught uh, malaria. And he nursed every one of them back to health. Didn't lose the first Union soldier. So the president then pardoned him. But his ancestors are trying to get his complete record clean because the pardon is one thing, but he's still uh, been convicted of, you know, in the conspiracy and they're trying to get that thrown out because he never, he was just happened to be the doctor where he stopped in to, uh, to treat the broken leg and the Hippocratic Oath says you just, you know, you take care of them. Yeah. So, and the best fishing in the Gulf of Mexico is the dry tortugas. And why are the dry tortugas called the dry tortugas? No fresh water. But you can go and camp out overnight and just spend a week there, just snorkeling and just, that's what I did when I went was on my bucket list, so. And uh, one of my customers, uh, God bless him, had a jewelry store there. And he said, Al, didn't you tell the dry tortugas, did you tell me about them? And I said, yeah, it's on my bucket list. He said, we're going tomorrow. So eight o'clock the next morning, I'm there at the dock. We get on his boat and we go out and uh, we went fishing, and then we stopped at the Dry Tortugas, Fort Jefferson, I took some pictures, it's in my phone, and uh, we just made a day of it. So we came back with a bunch of fish, we pull into Key West, and uh, there was four of us, there was two young guys about your age, and they, had, man, they caught so many fish, it was unreal. Anyhow, we get back, and uh, I said, well, are we going to clean the boat? And he says, Al, you know the two guys that came with us? I said, yeah, they cleaned the boat. <laughs> We're sitting up on the pier. It took them 45 minutes to clean that boat, to get all the blood up and clean everything. And I'm, I'm sitting there. I, call, I said, Jane, this is Al. I'm, I'm in Key West, just came back from the Dry Tortugas. Remember I said I wanted to buy a boat? She said, yeah. I said, I changed my mind. <laughs> Too much work. Yeah. <laughs> It'll make you feel like you're back in the Navy then. Well, I love the Navy, really. I really did. Um, but like I told you with the jewelry story too, I, I didn't like being transferred. I want, you know. Yeah. I, I had already, I, I sowed my oats, you know, four years in the Navy. I did all my traveling. I did all my whatever I wanted to do. It got out of my system. I came back and uh, I met Gabrielle and I was married December 31st that year. That was it, so. As we begin to wrap up yeah. uh, the story, um, has your service impacted your feelings about war or the military in general because you go in during a very controversial time uh, with a controversial war like the Vietnam War um, but having served experiencing military Navy life and now you have all these years between there and and what when you were in 
do you think your feelings towards that kind of stuff has changed or um, you get a different understanding of, of that? Well, back when I was in the Navy <clears throat> and I was friends with this guy, Dave Binder, <clears throat> and he said, Al, I'm going to Vietnam. You know, I'd like you to go with me, you know? We've been friends, you know, and I don't want to part with you. I mean, really, you've been a real good friend. I said, Dave, I don't want any parts of Vietnam, really. Um, I just don't believe in what we're doing there is right, really. So uh, he went to Vietnam and he got Agent Orange and he's 100% disabled but he is just one fantastic guy. I mean, he really is. And he, he came back and he got married and he had a son. And uh, his son, Matt, was gonna be an astronaut. And he's over at Cape Canaveral going through the, uh, the training and everything. And they gave him a medical exam and they found out he had a back problem. So he uh, couldn't become an astronaut. But his friend, his friend, uh, his, his son Matt, is a school teacher, and he's just a phenomenal school teacher. He he gets into his position, and he just bonds with his students. And now he's married and got two two kids, and still living up in Pennsylvania. But. Uh, I'm looking forward to my friend Dave coming down. In conclusion, what I'd like to say is that when I joined the Navy in April 1962, I never realized the benefits that I would have in my later years of life. I mean, um, I've had a problem with my vision, with my eyes. I had cataracts, and the VA sent me to the top surgeon here in uh, Sarasota County, Florida, Center for Sight, and he did my cataracts, both my left eye and my right eye, and thanks to him and the VA, I can see phenomenally. Uh, my other VA doctor is Dr. Karen Reeves, and uh, she is my eye doctor, and she's at the Bradenton Clinic in Bradenton, Florida. And she has taken care of my eyes now for 15 years. And I go twice a year for a checkup. And she did find a problem. One time I had a macular pucker, which I've never heard of before in my life, but she sent me to a surgeon in Bradenton, Florida, who operated. And now I've got phenomenal vision because of her. And, um, she prescribed for me eye drops so I don't get glaucoma because my pressure was 20. And now my pressure is like uh, 11 and 12 in both my eyes. And um, all I do is when the drops run out, I call an 800 number, I give them the prescription number and it comes five days later from the VA hospital in St. Petersburg. Um, so all that I can say is that I never realized when I joined the Navy back then that I'd have all these benefits now later in life. But the most recent one is, the, uh, is my knee surgery. Okay, up until that time, I used to get uh, cortisone shots in my knees. And I would go to the VA clinic here in Sarasota or the VA clinic in Cape Coral and I'd get cortisone shots, and they would last me for six months so that I didn't have pain in my left knee or my right knee. But eventually, it got so bad that even the cortisone shots didn't help, and I would ha had to have my knees replaced. So, um, But aside from that, um, the latest with the COVID-19, um, I'd go to the VA, and I got my uh, my shot first time. I got my second shot, 
the second time and I got my booster shot. And my wife also went to the VA and she got her booster shot with me. And it's just been a phenomenal experience. And I'd just like to say also that we were very blessed to be here in Florida with such a, a great governor, Ron DeSantis, and a great um, congressman, Congressman Stubbe, um, because he's just really out for us veterans and does a great job. So I'd like to personally endorse him, really. He's also a veteran, and uh, but he's he loves this country like I do. And uh, I'm proud to be an American, and I'm proud to be a veteran. And thank you for your time. My buddy, Dave. <laughs> yes, Dave. No, you'll never guess where I am. No, I'm giving a testimonial to a young man named Matt, who's a, he works for the congressman, Congress, Congressman Stubbe. He's also a veteran. And what, I'm, what I just dictated, how many hours I've been here, Matt? Two. Two hours I've been here. Actually, it's three, I came at 12. Oh, we've been recording for two hours. Yeah. Anyway, I, I just recorded my whole history and I mentioned my friend Dave Binder, um, yeah, who we parted company because my friend Dave went to Vietnam and I didn't. So, but uh, let me finish up with Matt and I'll give you a call a little later, okay? We sure are. I just told the, I just told, his name is Matt, by the way. Does that sound familiar? Matthew means gift from God. That's what he just told me. By the way, um, that's the other thing I'm going to tell him when I hang up the phone. Have a blessed day, David. See you, see you in two weeks. God bless. Bye-bye. So I'm in church, and uh, one of the uh, people in the congregation comes over to me, and he says, Al, aren't you a veteran? And I said, yeah. He said, Al. I just came from the VA and I got these phenomenal hearing aids. They're phenomenal. No batteries. They go right in your ear. You don't see them. You take them out at night. You put them on a charger. The next day, they're good to go. I said, really? So I went up to the VA and I got these two hearing aids. So you didn't hear the conversation with my friend Dave because it went right to my hearing aids. It's Bluetooth, of course you know. You're a young guy, you know all about that stuff. So, I mean, really, I, I just cannot believe the benefits that I've gotten from the VA, really, so. And uh, yeah, just really blessed, really blessed.